Welcome to another life-impacting message from City Light Church. You can find more great content like this online at citylight.church. Hi, my name is Carl and it's great to be with you this morning. Um, This week I went to Woolworths and saw a friend of mine, a young fellow who was working at the front the, um, front of the store. And I asked him how he was going and he said to me, horrible man, I'm just horrible. And my heart really sunk, right, as I started thinking about his friends and maybe his family or maybe someone sick or his job. And then what he said next nearly made me burst out laughing, right? He said, isn't Zoom horrible? And I nearly laughed straight away because I felt him on that one, right? He started telling me that, he goes, never before has uh, hanging out with my friends felt like a job interview, right, where I'm staring at like 12 people who are staring straight back at me. It is the most invasive experience of my life. And I get it, right? I absolutely get it. I don't know if you know the term Zoom fatigue, where people are just so sick of video calls and video conferencing and Google Hangouts and Facebook FaceTime and Zoom, that they would prefer live a life of isolation and solitude rather than have one more connection with someone via technology. That's true right? But it's also true that now more than ever, people are feeling isolated and lonely and depressed and in need of connection. So we have these two competing paradigms, right? I hate technology. I want nothing to do with it. And I don't want to be alone. We're in a series at the moment called um, What the World Needs Now. And it's really asking the question, what does the world need now from us from me, and what does the world need now from you? And I really believe with a full conviction in my heart that what the world needs right now from you, from me, from us is for the church to shine brightly. Maybe to shine brightly more than it ever has before, at least in our lifetime. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, you, we, us, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all of the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The church right now needs to shine brightly so people living in darkness may know that there is light, that there is hope, that there is future, that there is something worth living for. So this morning, we're going to ask the question, how do we do that, right? How do we shine brightly in the midst of a world full of darkness? And so we're going to ask, uh, we're going to cast our eyes back to Acts 2, 42 to 47, where we see the very first church emerge on the scene. And we're going to ask some questions. We're going to say, what is the demeanor of the first church, right? We're going to say, what was the first church devoted to? And we're also going to ask the question, what is the driving force behind Uh, The very first church that, though it existed in a world of darkness, shone brightly. So let's pray and then we'll open up God's word. God, we thank you that we can lean upon your word. We thank you that we have technology now to be able to um, be a medium by which we can gather together. And we are asking for you to be on display. Would your words um, rest in our heart and would anything that I would say that would not glorify you would it fall away. May lives be changed. May you be glorified. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, what is the demeanor of a thriving church that is a light, right? What do, we, what do we mean by demeanor? We really mean posture. We mean attitude. Um, when, when I tell my boys off, they have a posture towards me right? Um, My eldest boy, when I tell him off, he's just four years old, he feels shame. His shoulders slump down, he gets a bit embarrassed, he might cry. His attitude or posture towards me is embarrassment. My next boy, Tommy, when I tell him off, his posture towards me is pride, right? He loves that he got told off. He has this big grin on his face, he runs around his house. His attitude is totally different. And you and I have an attitude or a posture towards spiritual things. And the question we need to know is, does it line up with the attitude and the posture of the first church? Or are we really different? Well, what do we know about the first church? Well, we know that the first church was um, very fragile, right? It was very young. It couldn't have been more than a couple of weeks old. This church that we read about in Acts 2, 42 to 47, more than a couple of weeks old. We also know that the first church was under threat. So the church was young, 
The church was fragile. The church was under threat, yet it flourished, yet it shone brightly. So what was the demeanour of the first church? Well, there's two different words we're going to look at. And the first word is this, the, the demeanour, the posture of the first church was the posture of awe. So if you've got your Bibles open, I hope you do, look down at verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. The early church was an awe-filled church. It was a church of reverence. It was a church of wonder. The Greek word that gives us the word awe is the word phobos, right? Which is also where we get the word fear from. And fear today doesn't really translate to biblical fear. Um, If I told you to be fearful of something now, you would run away from whatever it is that I told you to be fearful of. But in biblical times, the, the fear that they had of the law meant a complete reorientating of their life actually towards the Lord. That they would say that they didn't want to be led by their own um their own comfort, their own desires, but they wanted to be led by the Lord because he was sovereign and he ruled rightly over them. They lived these reorientated lives of surrender. But the question is, what actually caused them to surrender their lives? We'll look down at verse 43. It says, many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Many wonders and signs. God was at work. God was at work among them. They weren't um, consumed with their musical preference, right? With their desire towards style. The early church was convicted that God was at awe. See, many churches today, they lose their awe for God because their gaze fixed to the, fixes to the things that they shouldn't. They get interested in style. They get interested in technology. They get interested in tradition. But the church saw God at work. And friends, do you know that right now in the season that we're in, we need to fix our eyes on the God that is at work because right now in our church community, there are people that are repenting of sin. There are people that are letting go of habits. There are people that are leaning upon the Holy Spirit like never before. There are people that are living out the one another's like never before. There are people joining discipleship communities that have never been part of discipleship communities. Right now in our church, God is at work. And we need to be the kind of people that are showing the rest of the world that though we are isolated, the Spirit of God is not isolated. That we may be socially isolated, we're not spiritually isolated. That God is at work among our people all throughout this city. And the world living in darkness needs to know that. There is another word that describes the demeanour of the Acts Church. Look down in your Bibles in verse 46. It says, And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. This was the, there was this profound sense of thankfulness among the people of God. They were a thankful people, but they weren't thankful because their preferences were being met. They weren't thankful because life was convenient because it wasn't. They weren't thankful that they could worship wherever they wanted to because they couldn't. Right? They were thankful because of this. Look down in verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They saw people's lives being transformed by the gospel and they were thankful. They didn't care about what they saw um, in their material possessions because they saw lives being changed by the gospel. They saw people walking away from sin, entering this new relationship with God and being called a children of the Father and it filled their hearts with delight. They were filled with this delight because of things like what Paul said in Colossians. He said, And you who were dead in the trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us, With its legal demands, watch this, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That your sins and my sins and the sins of anyone who would repent before the Lord would be nailed to the cross and they would be remembered no more. And it filled their heart with thankfulness. They were not interested in what was convenient. They were interested in the cross. That Jesus changes lives. So let's apply this gospel reality 
to our lives right now. Do I have Zoom fatigue? Absolutely, I have Zoom fatigue. The word Zoom is like nails down a chalkboard to me, right? Well, what do we do with that? What do we do with that pain? We preach to ourselves and we remind ourselves that we live not for our own convenience. We live for the glory of God. And because we live for the glory of God, seeing people's lives changed, we don't live for the norm. We live for our neighbour, right? We don't say, I just wish things were the way that they were. We go, I want to seize this opportunity today, not because I have the strength to do it, but because he is worth it. And I want to see more and more and more lives change for his glory. So what's the demeanour of a thriving biblical church that is a light? It is awe and thankfulness. So let's now ask, what should a thriving biblical church be devoted towards? Well, in verse 42, it tells us, doesn't it? It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, not their preferences, not their tradition. They devoted themselves to the word of the Lord. They didn't pick and choose from it. They said they wanted to surrender their lives unto his word. Um, One of my favourite things to do in my 20s was to go to this restaurant called Settlers because it was a filthy all-you-can-eat restaurant right? I'm one of those guys, I'm happy to eat spring rolls that have been sitting there for six hours. That's just my jam, right? And so I would go to Settlers with my friends and I would just stockpile all this food up, right? And what happened at the end of this season of my life was I became fat and I became sick, right? Because living for your own preferences, it can cost you. When you live for your own preferences, you run a risk. You run the risk that it was the thing that you once delighted in will actually burn you down the road. And the thing that you delight in now can actually be stripped from you. So the early church didn't devote themselves to their preferences or to what they saw with their eyes. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They said, And this is so important now where we see so much of what makes our identity up being stripped from us. Um, I used to get my identity from uh, going to the club. That's gone. I used to get my identity from my job. That's gone. I used to get my identity from just hanging out with my friends and now I hate it, right? So where do I get my identity from? This early church got their identity from the word of the Lord and this is what they found. They turned to the word of the Lord and they found that his grace is sufficient for us. Amen. How incredible, right, that I don't need to pretend to be strong, but it's actually in my weakness that God is going to use me. They found that while we were still sinners, God died for us, that I don't need to strive to get the attention of the Lord, that I don't need to work all my sins off to gain the love of God, But while we are still sinners, the love of God comes to us. And they found that I can do, we can do, you can do all things through Christ. He gives you strength, meaning in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your persecution, in the midst of your isolation, that the helper is going to meet you where you are and is going to be able to use you profoundly for his glory. See, friend, if you're not a Christian and You've just tuned into this gathering. Maybe someone shared it. And if you haven't shared the stream, I encourage you to share the stream so we can reach the world with the gospel. You might be watching this now and you'd say, I don't want to um, submit to the apostles' teaching, which is the word of God, which is the Bible, because I don't want to have my joy ripped away from me. Well, friend, the exact opposite is true, Mm -hmm. that when you submit to the word of of the Lord, you don't have your joy stripped away. You have the joy of the Lord given to you. And it is multiplied and it is multiplied and it is multiplied. And I've found as a testimony of my my life, when I submit to the word of God, I find joy even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of trials and even in the midst of temptations. And the promise to you is that it will happen to you too. So they submitted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They also were devoted to the fellowship. Look down in verse 44. It says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, this scene is really specific, right? It was a big deal for the Jews to go to Jerusalem and to visit the temple. Some some of them did it just once in their lifetime. 
They would go on this big trip, which often involved them selling all of their possessions or carrying all of their possessions with them. They would get to Jerusalem, then they would sell all their possessions so that they could make their way home. But many Jews were getting saved in Jerusalem, joining the Christian community, and they were just running out of possessions. And then so the church sold everything that they had so that everyone had everything that they needed. What the church said was, if you've got a problem, I've got a problem. And if you've got to win, I've got to win. We're not connected by culture. We're connected by Christ. How unbelievable is that? That we don't need to like the same sports or like the same TV show. I hated Tiger King. I don't understand Tiger King. If you've seen Tiger King and you like it, you need to message me and explain to me that show. I don't get it, right? But we can be friends anyway because of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what unites us. What is the most stressful thing about your first day at school? I remember my first day at primary school and it was exactly like the movies, right? I met at the principal's office and they found some kid who didn't want to walk me around the school but had to walk me around the school, the library, the gym. Then you walk through like the heart of the school and there's all the different groups there. There's like the rockers and I'm old. So there's like the rockers and the goths and the punkers and the jocks. And you're looking around and you, the most stressful thing is, is saying, what group am I going to belong to? Right? And the truth is in our culture, we belong to these groups that all have an expiry date. You're friends with some of the people from your school. You finish school. You don't really see many of them again. You go to university and you're friends with people in your class. You leave university. You're not really friends with them again. You go to a workplace, you're friends with the people at work, you get a new job, you're not really friends with them again. But not so in the community of Christ. We're not united by our culture. We're united by what Christ brings to us, that we are all equally undeserving of his grace, but we receive it. We are all equally able to receive his grace. We are all equally saved. We are all equally called his children. And so we are all equally united. So we get to say to one another, if you have a problem, I have a problem, and we carry this weight and we carry this burden together. That is what marked the early church. And that was what will mark us today if we want to be a church that shines brightly in the midst of darkness. We should be a church that are devoted to the apostles' teaching, broken, uh, devoted to one another, and then also, finally, devoted to the breaking of bread and prayer, the ministry of remembrance, right? This is what Colossians 3.16 says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. You know, when you gather right? Even if you're gathering online, though we will gather again one day in person, arm in arm. When you gather, you're not just gathering for your sake, you are gathering for the sake of the people around you, reminding them that God is faithful and he has not forgotten any of us, right? Listen to Colossians again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We gather together to remind one another that even though the world may feel dark, the true reality is that we have a light and that light is eternal and that light is the person of Jesus. And it may be that um, you are that person that is walking on cloud nine and your relationship with the Lord is this walking picture of delight, right? But for many other people, that's not the case. Many other people who have lost jobs or, or um, feel isolated or were halfway through a university degree that didn't, doesn't transfer very well um, online but still keeps pushing ahead, right? That they feel this great weight of this season. And when you are joining online now and you send a text message to someone and let them know that, that you're thinking of them or you offer to pray with someone or you push through Zoom for the sake of relationship. You let them know that God so loved us with a certain kind of love. Even though we could give him nothing back, he poured himself on others. And in response to that love, we can pour ourselves on to other people. We have the opportunity to be a devoted people. The question you might be asking is saying, well, Carl, that sounds like a lot of work, right? That's a lot of devotion. What's going to 
bring me through this season where I feel like I can barely look after myself? How am I going to look after other people? It's a good question. What is the driving force of a church that has a blazing light, that is shining brightly? To answer that question, we need to go back to Acts uh, 1. When my wife and I first arrived at City Light, um, we had uh, a plan to plant a church, which is still very much the plan, right? We, we, we would come and we would um, have this great plan of, a, of gathering a core team and meeting a whole bunch of people and then becoming friends with a whole bunch of people and then going and planting this church. And But what happened was that the first Sunday we came, we met some people, then I worked one week, and then that Sunday we were introduced to everyone, and then the next day, lockdown, Right? No more services, no more meeting people. And from our perspective, it was no more plan. And I really believe that's exactly where God wants us to be. Not putting our confidence in a plan, but putting our confidence in a person of Jesus Christ, right? And I remember driving my car around and I was like, what guarantees uh, the health of a church? What guarantees the success of a church? Is there anything in the Bible that guarantees the success of a church? And there is. It's that the Lord Jesus builds it. That the Lord Jesus builds his church, not the plan of you and I, right? I don't know if you remember the plan of, uh, that Jesus gave to his disciples. That plan was a paralyzing plan. Remember the plan? Um, take the gospel to uh, Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember the plan? Take the gospel to Jerusalem where they killed Jesus, right? You want me to take the gospel to where they killed Jesus? Yeah, and after you do that, I want you to take it to Judea and Samaria where they hate Jewish people. You want us to take the gospel there? Yeah, and after you do that, take that to the ends of the earth, which everyone knew was Rome, so where it was a capital punishable offence to call anyone Lord but Caesar. That's the plan? That is a paralysing plan. So what is going to be the driving force to help us pursue that plan rightly? Well, the driving force is going to be the promise of the Heavenly Father for the person of the Holy Spirit, for the person of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words in Acts 1 verses 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, to wait For the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. But you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And what we know is that the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit baptised his church, and the Holy Spirit fills every believer who would receive the Holy Spirit and lean upon the Holy Spirit. And I once heard a pastor say that um, their, their opinion that 90% of the churches in Australia, if the Holy Spirit left the church, the church would just keep on going. And what a shame that is, right? But the truth is, is that we could meet like this forever and we could have the daggiest building, though we have a nice building. We could have the daggiest building and daggiest tech gear. But if the Holy Spirit delighted to bless this church because we were submitting to his presence, then God would use us profoundly in this world profoundly in this world that needs the church to shine brightly. But maybe some of you are running out of fuel right now, right? You, you, the life for you is feeling like you're dragging yourself across the finish line. And this week, I literally ran out of fuel, right? I was um, driving to pick something up. And I don't know if you're like me, but I like to test the fuel gauge on my car. So for 20 years, I haven't run out, run out of fuel. And I was just testing the fuel gauge and I, I tested it for about a week. So I was doing pretty well. And then I, I was like, I'd better go to a petrol station. And I made the decision to go up the hill instead of down the hill. So at about 15 metres to go, I, um, my car conked out and I was stuck. And I was so disappointed, right? Not that I'd run out of petrol, but that I ignored the warning signs. And it may be that for you right now, you're seeing the warning signs and your plan is just to drag yourself over the finish line. Well, I was annoyed at myself because um, fuel wasn't available when I needed it the most. I thought that I could do it on my own and what happened was that my fuel ran out. 
And God's promise to you is that you don't need to drag yourself over the finish line, that you don't need to test the fuel gauge, right, to see how low you can get doing it on your own. And then once a week you come back to church, fill yourself up, and then throughout the rest of the week you test that fuel gauge. The truth is, is that the Holy Spirit is available to you right now, right where you are, so that you might shine brightly for your sake, for the sake of the people around you and for his glory. And it might be that the best thing for you to do right now, the best thing for us to do is just to stop and say, God, we want to shine, but I'm running on empty. I've been trying to drag myself across the finish line and I need you. Because the truth is, is that the world needs the church to shine brightly. But a church that shines brightly is a church that is fueled by the Holy Spirit, not by your own strength. So I just want to pray for you now. So wherever you are, you might like to bow your head and we're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to do what he does and that is to fill his church by his power. So God, we just want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you that your word uh, does give us a plan that we can lean upon. We ask God, we know that because you have given a plan that you will also give us the power to accomplish that plan through the person of your spirit. And I just want to pray for that person now who feels tired and worn out and stressed like they're running on empty. And God, I pray that you would give them this conviction not to do it in their own strength, not to do it divorced from Christian community, not to do it divorced from prayer, not to do it divorced from your word, but that they might do it prayerfully saying, Spirit, fill me. Spirit, guide me. Spirit, lead me. So I can shine for the sake of myself, for the sake of others, and for the sake of your glory. Pray these things in your name. Amen. For more great content, more information about City Light Church, or to donate to the work of City Light Church, visit us online at www.citylight.church.